morning, family. Uh, I guess Jose said it's a watery lesson. What is that? And uh, that all makes sense by the end. Uh, open up your Bible to James chapter 4, verse 14. And uh, we got, it's a really important lesson. Super important. Because I think sometimes we don't reflect on how we view life, how we view time, how we view our decision making process, and, and that's what we're going to talk about. Life and time and the decision making process. How, how we actually live our life. And you know what? Life is short. Yes, it is. Right? I mean, the average American male lives to 75 years, and the average American female, 78. So on average, right? Could be a little higher, could be a little lower. Right? So in theory, that's how much we have to live. Now, none of us are zero, right? So for me, I'm 27. So I got about 50 years left. Right? And it's crazy when we start to look at the facts. And we start to think about our lives. It's like, wow, life is short. And sometimes we can be deceived and think life is long. Well, I got forever to get around to this, to get around that, to do that. I got forever to get around to changing this and changing that. No, we don't even like change. Oh. I say the word change, and maybe some of you guys cringe. Like, oh, <laughs> but if we were to take the sum of our lives, 70 years, and put that onto a, a timeline of all of knowing history. 70 years is a speck of dust. It's a little tiny dot Boop. on this thing called time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like how many people do you remember from 100 years ago? Yeah. Right? 1919, that would be 100 years ago. Who do we remember? Who do we talk about? Whose life did something impactful? Yeah, we don't even know. So then in 100 years, who will remember us? What kind of life are we living in, in the, the, when we face that fact? How do we make our decisions when we face that fact? Right? And, and I think this is how we have to start to think. We have to see things from, we have to zoom up 30,000 feet and get a big picture of things. We have to see things big picture so that the little picture, our lives, actually make a difference. Our lives actually have impact. Let's go to James 4. I think the Bible calls us to take such a point of view of our life. James chapter 4 verse 13, the Bible reads, now listen, so please listen, listen you who say today, tomorrow, we will do this, we will do that, we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on, business, we'll make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this. Or do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, Ooh. and all such boasting is evil. And if anyone then knows the good they ought to do, and they don't do it, it is sin. And this is such a powerful passage because James says we live our lives not really giving thought to our decisions, to our actions. And if we do, we maybe think as far as tomorrow or the next day or next week. Some of us, this is what I want to do for the next year. Make money, live comfortably, have a house, have a car, have a family, raise some kids. Not that those things in and of themselves are bad, right. but not bad things. Yeah. But we can think that's the end all be all sale. That's what's going to fulfill us. That's, that was the Lord's will for me. Yeah. Well, did we ever check with the Lord? Amen. Oh. We should conduct our lives with a Lord willing attitude, a Lord willing mindset. Oh, really? yeah. Maybe this begs the question. Okay, if there is an all-powerful, almighty God who made everything, and he has a will or a plan for me, what is it? Where can I find it? How can I get behind something that I don't know what it is? Or where to find it? Right? And thank God for the scriptures. And we're going to get into that today. And then once we get to know God's will, the second question is, are we surrendered? Are we absolutely surrendered and just, hey, whatever it is, whatever God's will is for my life, I'll do it. 
I'll go anywhere. I'll give him anything just to do God's will. Yeah. And that's what we're going to look at today. And I think in order to have this spiritual and biblical look on our lives, we're going to look at one of the most famous events in history. We're going to look at the most disastrous event in, in all of maritime or boating history. We're going to take a look at the Titanic. Yes! We're going to look at the Titanic. Now, if you've seen the movie, actually, as I was researching this out, the movie's pretty accurate. Now, I don't know about them going on the, you know, end of the boat, you know, Leo just holding her, like, I don't know if, if that happened, but a lot of the dialogue and the situations in, in the Titanic are very realistic from what history tells us. So let's, let's learn about some facts about the Titanic. At the time, in 1912, right, over 100 years ago, in 1912, the Titanic was the largest luxury cruise liner ever built. In fact, they had to create a new class of cruise liners, right? They called it an Olympic class cruise liner. Huge! It was huge. It was four city blocks long, 11 stories tall. The hole of the boat was five feet thick. So I'm like 5'10", so if you lay me sideways, that's how much iron, right? It was double reinforced iron, and it was that thick. That was the hole of the boat. It was huge. It was strong. Now, for its time, it was the most technologically advanced boat. So they had a whistle, right? And again, 1912. And the whistle was so loud, it could be heard 11 miles away. This was unheard of in this time. They had a radio equipped with Morse code. 1912. The first text message is beep, 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 right? And, and this radio could go up to 400 miles away. Now we're like, yeah, I can like call someone in Mexico if I want to right now. But like, again, at this time, this was the top of the line technology. It was a luxury cruise liner. It had tennis courts, gymnasium, uh, 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 restaurants that they hired out world-class chefs to cook in. It was just massive. There was a, a full casino there. It was awesome. Right? It could actually fit 2,400 people on board. In which is the passengers, the, the crew, the workers, employees, the captains, the commander, right? Everyone was there, 2,400 people. Newspapers at the time said it was unsinkable. In fact, one newspaper said, not even God himself could sink it. I read that one, I just handed it my ticket. I'm not even trying to sell that thing. I'm just going in. Oh, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> the, the captain's name was John Edward Smith. And so he did an interview, right? Again, like, at the time in the world, this was one of the most publicized. It, it was like worldwide, right? And so they did an interview with the captain, and he said, in my 40 years at sea, 40, 40 years, I would say it's been uneventful. I've never been in any accident. I never saw a wreck. I mean, we've had troubles, we've had to save a couple of boats, but I never saw like, a wreck. I've never been in any predicament of any sort. And Captain John Edward Smith was actually set to retire after this last trip. Oh, oh, man. He had no idea the cards being dealt out to him, what his hand was going to be. He had no idea the destiny, the fate that awaited him. And in our lives, just like Captain John Edward Smith, we have no idea either. Thomas Andrews, who designed and built the ship, he said, it is as perfect as any human brain can make a ship. You see, the Titanic was built on theories, pride, and procrastination. And we're going to look at that today. Right? We're going to look at that today. Theories, pride, and procrastination. Right, just to say, this is the best thing any human brain could make, was the Titanic. Let's take a closer look at, I mean, who was on the boat, right? We know the boat. We know we've learned about the boat. Yeah. Let's see who was on the boat. Well, uh, there was, you know, first class, second class tickets. You know, when you fly a plane, right? Yeah. It's called economy. Um, yeah. Basic economy. <laughs> Don't even get the carry-on. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> 
So a, a first class ticket in today's currency, right? If you were to account for inflation, it was ninety thousand wow. dollars. One first class ticket on the Titanic. Guess what? It had three hundred and fifty first class passengers. Three hundred and fifty people dropped ninety k. Boom! To have that ticket. John Jacob Astor. He was a first class passenger. He was worth, if you were to put his uh, monetary, his net worth into today's currency, he was worth $150 billion. He was on the boat. <laughs> Isidore Strauss, this guy founded Macy's, the department store, oh, wow. and Levi Strauss jeans. Yeah. He was on the boat. He was worth only $50 billion. Oh. Oh. Sorry, John Jacob, I'm $100 million shorter, but my bad. So in, in today's culture, it would be like, the, the Titanic had the Mark Zuckerbergs. It had the Bill Gateses. It had the Elon Musks. <laughs> Bill Gates. All the S's, right? They were all on the boat. The Kim Kardashians, the Kanye's. They were all there on the boat. Dropping $90,000 first class ticket. Right? On that fateful cruise, there was 13, 13 couples celebrating their honeymoon. Aww. On Wednesday, <laughs> April 10th, 1912, the Titanic set sail from Southampton, England for a seven day voyage headed for New York, New York, USA. But it, it wasn't a voyage to New York. It was actually a luxury cruise straight into eternity. Five days later, at 2 a.m., the Titanic was a coffin for 1,600 people. The iceberg that the Titanic hit sunk the ship in two and a half hours. 2,400 people on board had no idea. They had no idea. They just spent their money, their time, brought their family along, and they all got on the boat with the promise of New York in a week. And they were so sure, so sure, the world, people not even on the boat were so sure it was unsinkable. And that's the title of my lesson, An Unsinkable Faith. <laughs> By the end of this lesson, you're going to have an unsinkable faith. And I believe when we look at the facts, when we look at the events of the Titanic, there's lots of lessons for us. Lots of lessons that we can get insight into the human heart. Lots of lessons for our spiritual walks with God. And I believe as we observe the Titanic and, and, and draw from it some wisdom, we can actually get out of here changed. Yeah. Living our life for God. Some of you may be here and thinking, I just showed up, I had nothing better to do. No, 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 no. God wanted you here. God is trying to speak to you. He's trying to tell you his will for your life. And so I hope that we're paying attention. The first point of the lesson is facts trump theory every single time. Facts always trump theory every single time. And we're going to look at some of the theories of the Titanic. Theory number one. Captain John Edward Smith thought he chose the smoothest route from England to the United States of America. Fact, he chose the most littered, clogged up route that any captain could have picked. And I think we do the same things in our lives, right? Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that appears to be right to a man. But in the end, it leads to death. Usually, we make our decisions about where we're going and what we're doing in life, whether it be for the next day, next month, next year, right? What do we pick? The easiest path. Yeah. Right, don't we? The path of least resistance. It's, it's in us. Why make things harder on ourselves? Right? Or the minute the path gets hard, what do we do? Go right. this way. Yeah. I got too hard. Right? But it says those paths lead to death. Right? And I, I found in my life, for sure, usually when we feel that we should be on this path, I just feel it. 
Phil's the best one. We're wrong. Yeah. We're wrong. We're just wrong. That's not what we should be doing. Yeah. I wake up in the morning and sometimes I ask my wife, I'm like, babe, do you feel like going to the gym? Come do on. I, do, I, do I feel like going to the gym? Nope. Uh uh. But why do we go? Why do, why do we go? Why do we go to the gym? Why do we try and eat healthy? Do I feel like eating broccoli? No. no. Why though? Because we know that even though broccoli is nasty and even though working out is hard and it takes time and effort and money, right? It's healthier. Down the road, down the line, being healthy, eating and, and exercise is better for us, better for our heart, for our lungs, so one day we can play with our kids and our grandkids, right? Like, so we can't be surprised when we get there and we're unhealthy. But is it hard to do this path? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe some of us didn't want to go to college. Four, five years, six years, ah, it's so hard. I want to quit. Why do we go? Why do we go? Right? Because when we choose the path that is actually difficult, there is a reward. At the end, it's always better. It doesn't lead to death. Yeah. Right? Yes. And so, in the same way, following God might seem difficult or impossible or asking too much. No, 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 no. We follow God. We're not trying to be on the path that leads to death, but the one that leads to life. Let's look at the second theory. The second theory of the Titanic was lifeboats are not needed. Uh, I'm serious. I'm serious. Lifeboats weren't needed. It could hold a total of 48 lifeboats that could have held more than enough the, of the people on the boats. It could hold 48. They only put 20 lifeboats on the Titanic. Now, in retrospect, we kind of are shocked or uh, sometimes we might laugh. <laughs> they should have put 48. They're dumb. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but if we really think about it, we're the same way. Yeah. I should have studied for finals. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should have done my homework. I should, right? It's the same concept. We think we're good. So we don't take the necessary precautions or measures. Yeah. The Titanic was so big, it had more than enough room for all 48 lifeboats. But some of the arguments or reasons why is because it would clutter the decks. There'd be so much clutter, people can't walk around on the boat that's four city blocks long, 11 stories high. <laughs> they said that it was inconvenient. It would be in the way. People try to have a good time. They don't need these lifeboats in the way. We're not really gonna sink the pride. It was ugly. I just, it just looks gross. Right? The same way we get concerned with our self-image. What will people really think of me if I follow God? Same concept, yeah. right? So these were the theories of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. And we know facts always trump theories. Mm -hmm. I think in the same way we kind of looked at these facts of the Titanic, and in retrospect, we're like, what were they thinking? In the same way, salvation, faith, your Christian walk with God can be built and based off theories. Mm -hmm. You can have your faith based off theories and not biblical facts. Yeah. So let's just look at some of the theories. Let's clear up some of the religious theories and let's get the biblical facts of a Christian walk with God. Theory number one. I am saved by faith alone. All I need is faith and faith alone and I'm going to heaven. Theory number one. Fact number one. James chapter two. Let's pick up in verse 14. James, the half-brother of Jesus, leader of the church in the first century, writing the Bible through the Holy Spirit, says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose your brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but you do nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is dead when it is not accompanied by action. But someone will say, you have faith, I have my deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Yeah. See, doing deeds does not negate or cancel out your faith. Mm -hmm. You believe that there is one God, good! Even the demons believe that and they shudder. Mm. You foolish person, 
Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed in God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. This is the only time the phrase faith alone is in the Bible. This is the only time. And it's preceded by the word not. <laughs> You're saying not. N-O-T. Nice. By faith alone. Yeah. This is the only time. Yet the most widely taught like teaching theory of salvation is that all we need to do is believe in Jesus. Bow your head. Pray a little prayer. God, I believe in you. Forgive me my sins. Come into my heart. Oh, safe. Going to heaven. My walk with God, good. Show up on Sunday for two hours to some religious meeting where people talk about Jesus and go home. Monday through Saturday, God, what God? There's no actual genuine change. In fact, what we just did is not even in the scriptures. It's not based on fact. It's still a theory. Right? What is your walk, your faith, your relationship with God based on? I love James. He, he compares... Dead faith and a saving faith. He puts them in the same scripture. Wow. He says, if, if we believe but have no deeds, it's a useless faith. Mm -hmm. He says, a dead faith. Right? And then he says, if you have faith and deeds, it's a saving faith. He uses the word, it's a complete faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus understood this. Let's go to John 8. Come on. Come on. In John 8, 31 and 32, the scripture reads, to the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Right? So Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews who believed in Jesus. They intellectually thought he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, the chosen one, he's God and man in, in, in one being. Right? He's here. I believe that 100%. I mentally agree. Emotionally, I think it's true. Woo! And Jesus is like, yeah, you know what that does for you? Nothing. Mm -hmm. James would have said to those guys, congratulations! You have as much faith as the demon! Wow. Good job! Let's go then what's the difference between the faith of the demons and the faith of us? Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. What's the difference? Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, yeah. you've got to do what I say, what I teach. It's the actions. None of the demons do what Jesus teaches. They don't care. They're in rebellion against him. Yeah. So in the same way, well, what, what is it with us? We got to have faith. Yeah, we have to believe who Jesus is who he says he is, of course. Yeah. But then the actions follow. They, it says, like James said, they work together. Yeah. Yeah. Facts. Yeah. We don't got no theories. Big. Facts. Mm -hmm. I myself grew up in church. My dad uh, on the prayer team played bass in the worship band. My mom with my dad on the prayer team. They started going to church eight years before I was born. So I, I was at church three times a week, a Wednesday midweek, uh, Thursday night for band practice, and then Sunday for the service. We have to be there early because my dad would play the bass, you know, so they did the practice beforehand, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I get it. I've been around church my whole life, born and raised, grew up in it, you know? I never chose it, but that's, that was what I just thought was normal. And, you know, I was around 11 or 12, and I had a ton of questions. You know, how do we know God is real? What is the Bible? What makes this book better than, than any other book? And, I, you know, as a kid, you know, the curiosity of a kid. That was like, all these questions, right? And so my dad said, look, all you need to do is just pray, tell God you believe in him, ask him to forgive your sins, and he will, and then that's it. And so I did that at 11 or 12, and I thought I was good to go. I mean, by the time I was 16, 17, 18, I, would, I really didn't want to be at church. I was only going there for the girls at the time, right? Like, that was my motivation. Like, it, it really had no effect, no change in my life. I knew all the songs. I knew the Bible stories. I can tell you, you know, Moses, like, brought the Essene Prince of Egypt, the cartoon. I've been watching that. I've been watching that since uh, uh, nursery, right? Like, I knew, I knew, you know, he brought them out. The Red Sea parted. Noah, the, ark, the animals, two by two on the little boats, you know. It's like a big zoo of water, right? Kind of like the Titanic. And, and so, like, I, I understood. I, like, understood all this stuff. 
But I never once put the Bible into practice. Yeah. I never once did anything the Bible said. I never, I never cared. It, it really, it just did nothing for me because I didn't have any action. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? And so then we, we see clearly from the scriptures. We don't need to have just an incomplete faith where we intellectually and emotionally agree with the Bible. Mm-hmm. We actually have to put all of this into action. Yeah. And I understand what it was like to be religious, but to not have a saving faith. Yeah. Let's look at theory number two. Theory number two, I would say the theory of the American. That's what I call this one. Theory number two. If you're a good person, you'll get to heaven. Theory number two. I'm a good person. I do good things. God's going to send me to hell? Mm. Pride. Pride, pride, pride. Hubris. Right? If you're a good person, you'll get to heaven. See, we as Americans live this way. We tend to compare ourselves to the people next to us. Hey, I'm not as bad as that guy. At least I'm not robbing a bank. I never killed nobody. Right? Like These are kind of the thoughts that we have. Hey, I used to do that stuff, but not anymore. I'm above that. And so, hey, I'm a good person. I change. Right? God surely won't send me to hell. Theory number two. Good people, all good people, will get to heaven. Actually, just a theory. No facts. Let's look at Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Let's hear it from the big man himself. Jesus Christ. Let's go. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Come on, Nate. Come on. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I like the heaven. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. I'm pretty religious. You know the Bible. Jesus looked at him and Loved him. So it's the heart of Jesus. Love. One thing you lack. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then, after you've done such a thing. Then, come follow me. Mm-hmm. See, Jesus wants the total surrender to his will. Jesus wants us to live a life where we're like, man, if it's in the scriptures, if Jesus said it, I'll do it. Right? Now we know how this story ends. This man who, who desperately wanted to get to heaven, who was desperately religious, who desperately was like, good teacher, good teacher. If you read Matthew's account, he says, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Wow. Wow. He says, no one is good except God. Come on, bro. Right? And again, we might not even like this. That's fine. It's true. Believe the theory. Keep your theory. How about we live our life by truth? Come on, Come on bro. I, I think uh, uh, at, at, at times we, we are trapped in the prisons of our mind, in the guilt of our heart. Mm-hmm. And so we, we are usually our own toughest critics. Yeah. We know all the bad things we've done. Sometimes we don't even do the bad thing. We have a bad thought. And we think that one bad thought makes us a terrible person, which isn't, which isn't true. And so then we, we, in the prison of our minds and our hearts, we have this, this uh, scoreboard. And we, oh, bad thing, bad thought, one. Oh, bad thing, bad thought. Two, bad action. Three. Okay, I got to do four good things, right? One, two, three, four. To beat out the three bad things that I did. Otherwise, ah, oh, I'm just a terrible person. We can't deal with it. Even maybe we believe in the Bible, but we live our lives this way with that scoreboard. And we're trapped by the emotion, trapped by the guilt in ourselves. Jesus is like, dude, that, that's not how we're meant to live. Good and bad is not in our hands. It belongs to God. And he doesn't even, he just says, do one thing, give up everything. Surrender your emotions, your thoughts, give it all up. Give up life, give it everything up. And just let God be the good in your life. Let Jesus' sacrifice on the cross be the good in your life. That's actually how we're called to live. Guys, we, we cannot hold to these false religious theories. We know that the facts, that the truth will always trump the religious theory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In the same way the truth <coughs> trumped the Titanic. They needed more lifeboats. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. 
The ship was not unsinkable. Oops. It wasn't the smoothest course to the United States. Oops. But why do we wait? Why do we wait until the ship is sinking like this? You guys, if you've seen the movie, it sunk like that and then it went down. Why do we wait? It's too late. Maybe some of us think, like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna live my life however I want, and then right before I die, I'm gonna be like, hey, hey, yo, God, real quick, um, hey, yo, God, give me my sins, yo, please tell me, God, I love you, I've always loved you, right? And then we die, whether it's on our deathbed, car accident, lightning hits us. We don't even know how we're gonna go. Yeah. Nothing's guaranteed. What makes us think we can live this way? Yeah, come on, bro. Yeah. Yeah. You see, my second point is procrastination is incredibly destructive. Yeah. Procrastination. Yeah. It's incredibly yeah. destructive. So many analogies, homework, oh. at your job, a task you're supposed to do in your marriage, something you, you know you, you offer, maybe you offered it to do for your wife or whatever, for your kids, you know this needs to get done. Health insurance, amen. Hey, hey, hey. Just being honest, being honest. Being honest. <laughs> Just being honest, I procrastinate sometimes too. But procrastination is incredibly destructive. St. Augustine, famous theologian, says, God promises forgiveness to your repentance, to your change. But God has not promised tomorrow for you to procrastinate. Wow. Oh, come on, bro. Come on. You see, the, the day before the Titanic hit the iceberg, the day before, 24 hours, yeah. it received seven warnings mm. of heavy ice flow. Wow. 15 minutes before impact, the lookout, the guy who sits at the highest point of the ship and is like, <laughs> 15 minutes. He warned the officers and the captain that they were going to hit an iceberg. Wow. Yet, they did not act. No action was taken. No change was made until 30 seconds before impact. Oh my gosh. Life vests were not put on until the last minute. People would not stop dancing, drinking, gambling, partying until a series of explosions took place in the boiler room. Even as the crew mm. went around to all of the nice, you know, uh, luxurious things on the cruise liner. Guys, ship's going down. Guys, we need to abandon ship. Guys, we need to get on the life force that we don't have enough of, right? And, right? and then people are like, dude, you're crazy. It's the Titanic. It's unsinkable. Wow. Dude, I paid $9,000 for this ticket. No way. Mm. They kept on eating, drinking, party, dancing, pride, wow. procrastination, wow. Wow. theory. Right? Mm. Wow. Wow. Here's the thing. We're slow to change our lives. <laughs> Until what? A series of explosions yeah. happen. Yeah. I was 19, moved out of my parents' house. My parents got a divorce when I was 15, explosion number one. Uh, I started to party when I was like 17, 18. Still went to church, explosion number two. Mm. Right? I uh, went to a party with a friend one time. Uh, people rolled up, pulled out guns, shot. My best friend got shot in the leg. It hit his phone. We think it bounced off something. It hit his phone at an angle. Both of us woke up the next day hungover, right? And he pulled his phone out, bullet lodged in the phone. Wow. Crazy. Crazy. Wow. Eventually I got a DUI, drinking and driving, spent a night in jail, lots and lots of money, craziness. Explosions going off in my life. You think I would have stopped earlier? But I would not change until mm. the series of explosions, mm. right? Yeah. Procrastination is incredibly destructive. And I think, why do we procrastinate with God? Why do we procrastinate with changing, right? I think most of us, myself included at times, we think God is very important. Everyone says, oh God, yeah, you're the best, you're number one, you're important, I love you. But then we don't understand God is urgent. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an analogy. It's like finals. In, in finals week, or in, in a semester, day one of the semester, what's at the end? Finals. And usually those are make or break for you. So day one, your finals are very important. But are they urgent? Are they in your face? Ah, no. Now the week before finals, the week before the test, they're still important. But what's the difference now? They're urgent. Study now, hurry, right? A lot of people, we treat God as important. We don't treat him as urgent. He actually wants us now. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 6. Let's look at let's look at this from God's point of view. Right? Let's see what God thinks about procrastination. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 6. 
6. Verse 1. As God's co-workers, we urge you. It's urgent. Do not receive God's grace in vain. For God says in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait for the next explosion. Yeah. Why? God is urging you. He says, I'm here to give you favor. I'm here to help you. Yeah. Now is the day of salvation. Like Bradley said, Bradley let in, in a communion. I thank you for sharing vulnerably, bro. Yeah. But the explosions were going off. He wasn't happy. He knew there was a God out there. But he had to beg and cry out to God, God, help me. Then he came face to face with God in the scriptures. He was challenged to change, to live the way God called him to live. And he didn't procrastinate. He changed. He was baptized during finals week. And he had to move into the brother's house. During finals week, passed all his classes, became a disciple, and was baptized and is now your brother. Come on, Brandon. God wasn't just important to Bradley. Yeah. God was very urgent. Yeah. And Bradley understood this. Mm -hmm. We might be thinking, well, yeah, I'm a disciple. I'm already following God. Mm -hmm. What is God calling you to change? How is he calling you to grow? Mm -hmm. And are you surrendered to his will in your life? Yeah. Come on, bro. <laughs> on April 15th, 1912, there was a great procrastinator. It was a ship on the ocean near the Titanic. Ironically, it was the USS California. It saw the Titanic sink. It saw all eight <laughs> distress flares. Yeah. Upon being interviewed, they thought that there was fireworks from the deck of the ship. It didn't go over to save the people while they were freezing to death in the water. It stood by and watched as 1,600 people sank to their grave. The great procrastination. And to my shame, this can be me sometimes. I had the, the privilege to, to go and share with the singles this Thursday. We went to the California State Fair. As a, to spend time as family and go on the rides, it was awesome. But of course, being disciples, you know, our great job is to save those who are sinking. Save those who are drowning, who are still on the Titanic party. To show them the love of God, the salvation of God. So we went to go share. We challenge, share with 10 people, get two numbers, you know. Let's go save the people. The first, we walk into the fair, and you know, like, right when you walk in, there's the people with the cameras. Right? They're like, hey, let me take your picture. And then they give you the little card to, like, uh, so you go and you buy the picture on the way out. You know, the, the great and awesome memories that we all make. Right, and so the, the, there's a guy, I believe, if I remember correctly, his name was Kevin. And so he took our picture, picture <laughs> took our picture on an iPhone, which really defeats the purpose because then we're not gonna buy the picture of him. And so, <laughs> so I shake his hand, I'm like, hey, yo, Kevin, what's up, man? Yo, I'm Nate, you know, he's like, oh, nice to meet you. I said, like, where are you from? He's like, oh, I'm from Texas. I'm like, all right, cool, yeah, for sure. All right, well, thanks, and we move on. And my wife, I love my wife, she's so spiritual. She's like, hey, did you share with him? I know, I, I didn't share with him. I didn't ask him to say the Bible, come to church, to be a disciple. She was like, what, why not? She was shocked. And I was like, well, because he lives in Texas. Like, you know, he, he, he's not in Sacramento. I mean, we have two churches in Texas. One in Houston, one in Dallas, Fort Worth. Could have passed his number on. To be honest, to be honest, deep down, it was like, yeah, I'm gonna have to find like the evangelist number. It's Tyler, it's Tyler and Chase Sears. Pass the number on to Tyler. Then, you know, get Kevin's number and then hook them up and then they might not meet up. And the chances of someone making it all the way you know, like from California to Texas to be a disciple, like, you know, ah, it's fine. You know, I'm here to baptize you, Sacramento. I was just like the USS California. I, I, I took my theories, my thoughts, and I made them more important than what God wanted for Kevin. Yeah. I, I guess I'm imperfect. Yeah. Like, I, I, I struggle too. But I, they both pray and beg God to forgive me. But I, in that moment, I was like the USS California. Just watching everyone, watching Kevin drown in the water, in the ice cold water. You know? So this has to be us. Like, well, why do we not share when we need to share sometimes? 
You know, you walk by someone and like you just have that little urge, like, oh, I should invite that person to church. Yeah. But for whatever reason, you don't. Yeah. The great procrastination. Wow. Let's go to Matthew 9 in, in closing. Wow. Matthew 9 in verse 35. Preach it, bro. Come on. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news, the kingdom of God, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Chapter 10, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the instruction. So he sends them out to be the workers in God's field. To go heal the sick, save the lost. But the reason why Jesus first did this himself and then called other people to do it says in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Yeah. Yeah. They were harassed by life, harassed by theories, harassed by their own pride. They were helpless, just like the people drowning in the water. And because of that, he always wanted to be about his purpose, bringing people to heaven to follow him. Jesus would make followers of himself. And he calls us to do the same thing, to go out and to work. I went out and I shared with 10 people that day. Like, we actually ended up sharing like 15. Got to try to get numbers and buy people out to church, you know? But man, they just stuck right there in my heart. Mm -hmm. Why didn't I share with Kevin? You know? Now, sometimes when we do that, you know, we let it hold us back from sharing. We get so discouraged. Yes. You know? yeah. But we can't do that. Yeah. We're human. Amen. The grace of God is enough. Be strong in the grace, as Paul tells Timothy. But do we have the heart of Jesus? Are we compassionate? Do we see the world as harassed and helpless, just like we once were? Yeah. Come on, bro. God says that, that we, if we have the heart of God, the heart of Jesus, we're going to share everywhere we go. Come on, bro. The people that we see, we're going to invite them out to church. We're going to bring them into this family. We're going to bring them face to face to God with the scriptures. Because God says, do not receive his grace in vain. The day of salvation is today. Come on, and to God be all the glory. Thank you. Thank you.